Humans have looked at the sky since, well, before we were human, really. They've always had a hold over us. Just looking out there puts everything in perspective sometimes. Wait, 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 oh, yeah. wait, 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 no, no, okay, so mm. you've done, oh, okay. astrobiology, okay, you've done yeah. comets, asteroids, mm -hmm. planets, galaxies, moons, yeah. nebulas, all the rest of that stuff, but where's the okay. astrobiology, huh, yeah. right, huh, fair enough. huh, blah, 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 Get blah, 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 go on, get, go on, get out of here, punk, who let him in, eh, that was a good point. That was getting to it, believe it or not. What is astrobiology? What's the story behind it? In Europe, astrobiology actually has a long philosophical history going back many centuries. The idea that we're not alone in the universe has been around since, well, we first came down from the trees. In fact, it's fair to say that ancient people probably were more comfortable with the idea than we are. I mean, you know, we've all heard stories of angels and demons and ghosts and fairies and Cultures all around the world have stories of beings coming down from the skies and intervening in our affairs. It was the advent of the Renaissance. In the Middle Ages, we're beginning to slowly give way to more reasonable points of view about the world and how it worked. Like I said, the idea that we're not alone in the universe has been with us since the beginning. But, you know, it's fair to say that people obviously had no way of really knowing what was out there or means of studying it. It was with the advent of new technologies such as the telescope that things and thinking really began to change. A tectonic shift, you may say, had been taking place in European scientific thought. As thinkers like Cardinal Nicolas de Cusa began to ponder the existence of life on other planets, or even the existence of other worlds at all. In the late 16th century, Giordano Bruno, an Italian priest, mathematician and cosmologist, expanded upon the then radical ideas of Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus originated the idea that the planets revolve around the sun. Up until then, and it had been the case for thousands of years up until then, people have believed that the sun and indeed the entire universe revolved around the earth. Wacky, huh? Bruno ran with the Copernican idea and went on to publish his own thoughts on the matter. Amongst these, the then reticle notion that other stars were simply suns like our own, with their own planets. He also suggested that these other worlds may have their own animals and inhabitants. Very forward thinking. As tended to happen to free thinkers in those days, in any age really, Giordano met with a horrible end and was burned at the stake, but his ideas and others like it were taking hold in Europe. Time rolled on, and by the early 17th century, scientists of the day were giving life on Earth some serious scientific thought. Johannes Kepler, one of the founding fathers of modern astronomy, wrote what is considered to be the very first science fiction novel, Somnium in which he wrote about the moon and its inhabitants. Christian Huygens was a Dutch astronomer immortalised by the Huygens lander, which landed on Saturn's moon Titan in 2005. Titan was his discovery by the way, good job. Huygens pointed the presence of waters of differing tempers on Titan and other planets in the solar system, other worlds, supposing these worlds to bear their own respective life. Now, this concept of waters of, of differing tempers was actually pretty close to the mark in the same way. Bear in mind that this was in 1655. Now, Titan does possess waters of its own temper, seas of liquid methane, and a thick, cloudy hydrological cycle all based on methane. Not a bad guess, don't you think? Huygens even toyed with the concept of uh, habitable zones, surmising that uh, inhabitants of a place like Mercury would suppose Earth to be uninhabitable because its distance from the sun would render it too cold for life to take hold, unlike the baking conditions they're used to. Now again, it's fair to say such ideas were a big deal for the time. In this day and age, we take at least the idea of extraterrestrials in our stride to apply this 
newfangled science stuff to the idea that just maybe life was out there somewhere rising elsewhere on another world due to natural processes that we could observe and record and study and one day understand was a really big deal. And again, remember, people were being executed by the church for these kinds of ideas. By the end of the 19th century, modern astrobiological concepts were being openly debated and discussed in the European and world scientific community. The theory of panspermia has its roots in the ideas of scientists such as Ferdinand Cohn and Lord Kelvin. In 1908, the Swedish chemist Svente Arrhenius speculated that spores could perhaps travel between worlds, propelled from Earth to another place by the electrical fields generated by auroras. In his book, Worlds in the Making, the Evolution of the Universe, Arrhenius discussed different chemical profiles that could give rise to life on another planet, one different to our own. Again, a really big concept for the time. He did disagree with Lord Kelvin, however, who had propounded the idea that microbes and spores could only travel uh, on a vector, like a, a meteor or a comet from one world to the next. Hitching a ride, so to speak. Whatever the case may be, the fact that such debates were taking place and exist at all was a really huge development, not only for astrobiology, but for science in general. Astrobiology has become a fully fledged scientific field in its own right. Today, we're not only hearing of new solar systems, new planets, new ideas regarding alien life every day, the origins of life, life on Earth, and extreme places, life on other planets, we're actually doing something to find it. Astrobiology hasn't always been called astrobiology, but it's always been around in some form or other. Thanks for making it to the end, true believer. I'm Ben, and thank you for watching Astrobiological, giving you the universe plain human. I'll see you next time.